and get started. Oh, and a few more folks joining. All right, hello and welcome to this Council on International Higher Education Research and Discussion webinar. My name is Angela Hoffman Cooper, and I use she and her pronouns. I'm the Director of Conference and Events with ASH, the Association for the Study of Higher Education, and it's my pleasure to welcome you today. Thank you for being here. Today's webinar has closed captioning enabled using Zoom AI. You can select the CC closed captioning icon on the bottom of your screen for the captions to display. Note this may be under the more option on your bottom menu, depending on the size of your Zoom window. This webinar is also being recorded. If you're joining us after this event and viewing this recording on YouTube, you may select the CC icon on YouTube for captioning. I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the land I'm joining you in virtual community from today. I'm joining with you today from the Anishinaabe Ojibwe Chippewa homelands in ceded territory established by the Treaty of 1842. The Shawamigan Bay region is home to the Bad River and Red Cliff tribes, located adjacent to Lake Superior or Gitchigami in what is today known as Northern Wisconsin. I acknowledge and respect the many indigenous people, past and present, connected to this land, and I understand my actions in this space, this community, have an impact on the people, land, and waters of the area. And I invite us to each reflect on the history and enduring presence of the land and people we are in relationship with as we tune in from our respective locations. I would also like to share my enthusiasm for the webinar today. This webinar is brought to you by the Ash Council on International Higher Education, CIHE. Today, Dr. Rosalind Ravy, our moderator, will be in conversation with Drs. Timo Aravera, Martin Finkelstein, Glenn Jones, and Ji Sung Young, recipients of the Excellence Research Award the 2022 ASH CIHE Award for Significant Research on International Higher Education for their edited book, Universities in the Knowledge Society, The Nexus of National S Systems of Innovation and Higher Education. We'll be using the Zoom webinar platform for today's discussion, and you're welcome to enter a question in the Q&A box as we go along. Additionally, ASH staff, me will be here behind the scenes to assist you should you have any questions for us or need any support with your experience during the webinar. You're welcome to send me a private chat here in Zoom, or you can always send me an email at Angela at ash.ws, and I'm happy to drop that in the chat so you have it handy as well. We also have our virtual code of conduct. Ash is committed to providing a safe, productive, and welcoming environment for our event participants, and I'll put that um, code of conduct in the chat as well. With that, I'm excited for our discussion today with our esteemed moderator and award-winning authors, and thank you for making the time to join us. With that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Raby to take us forward today. Welcome, everybody. I'm very pleased to see um, so many of you have decided to give your time to our special webinar. I am a member at large of the Council for International Educa Higher Education of ASH, and you can see here our membership. Um, we will be doing receiving nominations for um, open positions, so please watch the announcements that will be forthcoming. Um, we also encourage you to engage with um, our community by joining as a member of ASH, if you have already not become a member. And in the registration, you can indicate your interest in the Council for International Higher Education. Benefits include ASH pre-conference registration discount, bi-monthly newsletter, networking and social events, webinars such as this one, and connection with international educational researchers globally. Proposals um, for the uh, Minneapolis conference will be due April 20 in due in April 2023. So watch the announcements for that as well as the pre-conference um, sponsored by the council. The award that we are celebrating today was recognized as a highly significant research in the field of international higher education. 
unlike a lifetime achievement award or an award that focuses on a particular form of research, this award is focused on state-of-the-art knowledge and scholarship, whether it is manifested in a journal article, book, edited volume, research initiative, or other top quality contributions, which significantly changes thinking on a topic of, in the field. The book that we will be celebrating today explores the complex multifaceted relationships between national research and innovation systems in higher education. This book provides a foundational um, introduction to the concepts of knowledge society, knowledge economy, and these concepts ground the detailed case studies of 18 systems located across five continents. Each case study was written by a leading expert in the field and provides a critical analysis of the research and development infrastructure, the role of universities, and the implications for the academic profession. The book describes how nations in various geographic regions and at various stages of economic maturity are restructuring their university system to adapt to the new imperatives and provides a cross case analysis. Our presenters today, sorry about that, <laughs> are Timo Aravera, Professor of Public Management at the University of Lapland and Principal Investigator of the research team of professions in Arctic societies. Dr. Martin Finkelstein, Professor of Higher Education at Stetton Hall Universities in New Jersey. Dr. Glenn Jones, Professor of Higher Education and Dean of the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education, University of Toronto. And Dr. Um, Ji, Ji Jung, um, Ji, Ji Sung, sorry about that, Jung, Assistant Professor in the Faculty of Education at the University of Hong Kong. As you can see here, they, um, there's a bit more that you can read about their wonderful bios, but I just want to jump into the presentation at this time. Who is going first? I will, and I think uh, okay. Ji Sung is very wonderful. Good. Just waiting for Ji Sung's screen to come forward. There we are. So it's a great pleasure for us to be here today on behalf of my colleagues. Um, we want to thank um, uh, CIHE within ASH both for this invitation and of course for this wonderful recognition, the 2022 Council on International Higher Education Award for Significant Research on International Higher Education. Um, just to remind you of who we are in the next slide, um, you've already heard uh, a bit of our biographies. I think the key thing I want to mention at this point, and it'll come through very clearly through the presentation, is that while we are the co-editors of the volume, this very much emerges from a hugely collaborative, very large research project. So even with this book, there are 56 chapter authors or co-authors. There are 18 uh, jurisdictions represented in the volume emerging from five continents. The project that we've been working on involves multiple people, multiple jurisdictions, and a tremendous amount of collaboration and in international uh, conversation. Moving forward then, the in terms of what we hope to accomplish within this presentation this morning, um, we're gonna uh, provide an introduction to the book project, and even before that, an introduction to the academic profession and the Knowledge Society project that this book emerges from. We're gonna talk about the academic profession and universities in the Knowledge Society and the economy. We're going to provide some uh, hints at some of the comparative work that emerged from the volume. And the volume really focuses on trying to understand something about how higher education systems and the academic profession fits within national research and innovation systems around the world, recognizing huge differences in the ways in which both higher education and the academic profession are positioned within these emerging research and innovation systems. And then discuss some of the implications that this project leads to in terms of international and comparative higher education. What are some of the future possibilities in terms of studying based on this kind of work? Moving then to the next slide. 
So this emerges from a project called the Academic Profession in the Knowledge Society Project. Uh, the, the notion of studying the academic profession is far from new. There's been a long history of studying uh, the academic profession, both qualitatively and quantitatively within national systems. Um, but I think the, the notion of sort of using common surveys to try and explore the, the, the academic profession from a comparative perspective really emerged in 1992 with a large project that was funded by the Carnegie Foundation and led by our colleague Philip Altback. Uh, and that project involved uh, 15 teams. It was a centralized project administered by a very strong uh, academic leader, and it involved about 19,000 responses. Um, sometime later, we had a new project called the Changing Academic Profession. The survey for that project was administered in 2007. It involved 19 teams, uh, roughly 23,000 responses. And because of the nature of that project and increasing international interest, it led to a series of spin-off projects, EuroAC in Europe and other uh, regions that decided to also administer comparative projects. And then we're talking about a third sort of evolution uh, in the phasing of these international comparative questionnaire surveys of the academic profession. And this project is called the Academic Profession, the Knowledge-Based Society. Um, the survey work for this was administered around 2018, give or take a, a few years. Um, it currently involves 22 teams, and, and there may be some increasing numbers with that. Um, and it has about 42,000 responses that are part of this. Uh, central to the, the, the both the Changing Academic Professions Project and the Academic Professions and the Knowledge Society project is the recognition that this is not a centralized project. This is not like Carnegie, a project funded by a single body and led by a single kind of administrative team with others uh, working within that kind of uh, consortium. This is very much a series of projects that involves individual national research teams working collectively on a common project. So each national team has essentially found its own funding, it has uh, administered the project, made decisions about translation into local languages, and it has essentially, it's a very decentralized project that requires tremendous uh, elements of coordination. Um, and let me talk a little bit about that with the next slide. So the methodological approach is, is, is the notion of using a common questionnaire. Uh, this is the same basic approach that has emerged with Carnegie and then with the CAP project and then with this one. So you, you need to create a common uh, questionnaire, uh, and that leads towards the notion of a common data set. Um, but how do you manage a project like this? How do you govern a project of this immensity? Um, and keeping in mind, I think this is probably one of the largest, if not the largest, sort of academic research project in the study of higher education, uh, because it now involves over 20 countries, and, in, and each one of those national teams involves multiple individuals. So you're often including doctoral students, postdocs, junior faculty, and senior faculty on these research teams, and they all have to be coordinated. So each one of the national teams has a leader, and then we have uh, uh, two co-chairs who essentially try and herd the cats and try and facilitate the leadership necessary to move the project forward. And we are amply served by the masterful co-chairs of Timo Avrero, who is on the screen from the University of Lapland. And our, the other co-chair is Monica Marquina from the University of Buenos Aires in Argentina. And these two individuals have the challenging, uh, very challenging task of trying to bring consensus amongst individuals who are extremely interdisciplinary in their background, and of course, coming from very different countries and very different backgrounds to try and facilitate this conversation leading to this masterful large project. So you have a, a common kind of governance structure and you have uh, a common challenge of trying to essentially administer a, a survey uh, uh, across national systems uh, of the academic profession. And then, of course, the thematic conceptual approach is, is to try and investigate what are the new realities that affect academics' work and perceptions. This is a study about the perceptions of academics, recognizing the challenging times around them. And what are some of the challenging practices and perceptions that academics have? How are they describing the nature of their work? How are they understanding the challenges that are emerging around them? Moving on to the next slide, please. And so how do you ensure the quality of an international project that is so decentralized, but is and essentially involves so many scholars, different disciplinary backgrounds, different orientations? Well, you have a mapless planning phase, and this, this took place over quite a number of years, 
where you essentially are choosing the participating teams. There has to be a sense that, that the team has the capacity in order to move forward with the project. You have to coordinate the survey and the, and, and the, the ethical decisions relating to this. You have to be able to begin to plan publications and conferences around the project and, and a series of meetings that allow the project to emerge almost organically through a planning process. Secondly, you have to design the questionnaire. So you have a questionnaire that's essentially designed with the approval of these teams in these very different jurisdictions. There is an element of sort of path dependence here because you are to some extent trying to maintain a series of questions that allow you to look at change over time. Well, at the same time, you're also trying to explore new territories and add some additional questions that will address questions that are emerging or issues that are emerging within that particular time period. And then you're also trying to develop guidelines. Um, you, you, you want to methodologically ensure that you have valid samples and that you have good data that you're working with. Um, and you also have to deal with complex issues of language and translation because you are, of course, dealing with multiple countries, multiple jurisdictions, multiple languages. And then you move towards also creating a, a, an international data set at the end. And Timo will be talking about this a little later, but you have to think in terms of who's going to store the data. How do you centralize data management? Because you have to have common uh, arrangements and, and uh, common standards within this arrangement. And how do you enforce restrictions to the data, recognizing that you have multiple countries with multiple privacy legislations and you have uh, sponsors in each, each of these jurisdictions which have their own regulations uh, concerning how data will be dealt with uh, emerging from these research studies. Moving on to the next slide, please. So you, you do have a kind of conceptual, thematic and conceptual um, um, framework that emerged from these conversations. And, and one way of thinking about it is, is a common interest in understanding some of the changes taking place with the higher, within the higher education environment that may translate into changes in how academics work and in the experience that they have within the higher education systems that they're situated. So some of these include, for example, the pressures on the current higher education system from demands of the knowledge economy, the way in which institutions are being positioned within the knowledge economy, the notion of the higher education as an engine of economic growth, repositioned from its traditional educational role towards one where its research and, and relationships with industry uh, are perceived to have added value within the higher within the national uh, economic system. An increasing focus on tangible outcomes, such as publications and patents. The increasing uh, interest in world class and the notion of global rankings and vertical stratification within higher education systems, which have a huge impact on the way in which individuals are situated within that institution, because where they work plays an increasing role on their prestige and their status within that system. And you have notions of universities as resource generators, and that is, they, they are institutions that add value economically within the system. They're not simply users of resources, they actually can generate resources. This is the way the system is being positioned within some systems. I'm not suggesting this is a, a utopian arrangement. This is the challenges that we think faculty are often facing. And then, of course, you have an increasing international economic competition. Um, this, this notion that, that we have to win within this competitive environment. Um, and if so, what does that mean in terms of both the higher education system? And what does that mean in terms of the ongoing professional life of academics within that system? Uh, next slide, please. And so the academic, the, the APIC survey, which becomes the foundation for all this work, really ends up focusing on five broad areas. And that is it focuses on the career professional situation of academics, recognizing that their experiences are very different in very different jurisdictions. It focuses on their general work situation and activities. What are they doing? Um, how do they understand the nature of the work that they are undertaking? It focuses on their, on their teaching and their research and their knowledge exchange. The latter is particularly important in the context of the APEX project because it's about relationships between faculty and the broader society. It focuses on their perceptions of management and governance. How do they understand power and authority within those jurisdictions? And something about their personal background so that we can relate to personal variables within the configuration. And I'll turn it over to my colleague, Timo Rivera for the next phase. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, and uh, um, I will say some few words first about the database and then move on of the content of the volume. Uh, the basis of the comparative study is the international database and 
Operating principles at the heart of the APIC server are described in this volume. We need this volume to read the data in each higher education systems context. As APIC consortium, we operate in accordance with the general data protection regulation and responsive regulation around the world, aiming to protect the interest of both the respondents and the teams conducting the surveys. IDP is located in the IT Center for Science and the activities are coordinated by the Finnish and APICS team. In practice, we have implemented the cooperation in such a way that all users have signed a memorandum of understanding. It defines common operating methods and the possibility of using APICS data for comparative research. Each local APICS leader makes decisions about users who are members of APICS teams. This way, each team that implemented the survey has the opportunity to determine when the data will be used. This can come up, for example, if a team member is writing a dissertation in which previously unpublished results are of great importance for acceptance or grading. When all teams have accepted these intellectual property rights and ownership principles, it is possible to act according to the defined uh, ethical codes. We also apply the principles that uh, data is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So it's called FAIR principles. Here is an address for a web page where metadata can be found. And of course, <clears throat> we will provide more detailed information with data manager, Wille Tenhunen and me. So next, in the next slides, uh, 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 it is said that volume is divided into three independent, but also integral parts. In a comparative study, it is essential that uh, uh, a higher education system examinates have context beyond the data. The first part of the volume provides theoretical framework and concepts for country-specific analysis. And in the next uh, uh, slide, we can see that um, uh, some of higher case system can be described with concept related uh, to the knowledge society, and some can be justifiably described with the concept of knowledge economy. Aim is to bring in tools to, to define which of the higher education system in this volume can be uh, references to each others. The second parts look at the differences and similarities of higher education systems and the third part is a summary of the theoretical framework and analysis. Uh, in next slides, uh, well, uh, well, the, as editors, we have made a difference on the, these twin concepts uh, of the knowledge society and knowledge economy. Our aim in the, in the first chapter is to check light on global reforms, including declining public subsidies to the university, the introduction of new stakeholders into the academic enterprise, the decline in faculty control, the rise of uh, academic management, and new work pressures for performance. Uh, uh, in the first part, uh, Teresa Carvalho brings a framework for the imperatives of knowledge society, including the changing profiles, roles, careers, and prospects of the academic professions. Uh, in the first part, also uh, Olga Bain and William Cummings uh, analyzed the higher education's role in knowledge economy, its emphasizes on economic growth and a reoriented higher education. Based on this, they draw conclusions about the change in the role of the academic profession. But the fourth chapter in the first part describes how the APIX project is structured. Glenn Jones has already covered this section comprehensively, so I don't have to say anything else about this. Uh, in the next slide, there is about the second part. Yes, there are uh, teams that have uh, contributed the, the second part of the volume. Uh, uh, we ask at the writer's teams to tell a clear and compelling story about the organization of the contemporary national system of higher education, its relation to the national research and development system and the adjustments of the system over the past quarter century to the demands of assuring competitiveness in the global knowledge economy 
and knowledge societies. This included, firstly, a basic overview of national research, development, and innovation policy and chasing trends, including comparative data on R&D expenditures, it's OEC data, of course, and the attainment of national innovation goals. Secondly, the teams were asked to discuss the intersection between national research and innovation infrastructure and higher education and changes since early 1990s. The writers teams also discussed the national higher education system in terms of basic institutional types, distribution of faculty and work commitments and career trajectories. And they also asked ask to discuss the new generation of academics and current trends in PhD education and employment. And finally, the evolving academic reward system and trajectory of career progression. The third part is conclusions of all this uh, based on frameworks and analysis. And I will now give floor to Dr. Yisun Jung. Yeah, thank you, Timo. So as Timo mentioned in part two of the book, we the chapter also from 18 jurisdictions, they all provided a very detailed and critical analysis of their own systems like knowledge production system, a research development uh, structure and the role of the universities and academy professions. So as more and more case studies were collected, the editors were able to make a series of comparisons uh, historically and sociologically and also geographically. And this comparative perspective uh, became a kind of framework observed for observing similarities and differences across the systems, uh, especially in terms of how the government coordinates the older research and development systems and how much business and industries are engaged and what's the new roles of the universities and how the academics works are changing. So in part three, we did and this kind of cross uh, case analysis and we included all this comparative analysis in uh, as a part three findings. For example, first we identified um, the historical paths of research production systems across jurisdictions. Uh, some systems, they had already established research and development system since early 20th centuries. Uh, on the other hand, some systems had only started having kind of structured the system after 1990s, for example. And all these um, uh, differences, they were caused by the like, historical past. The historical influence was different uh, like uh, Second World War, for example, or dictatorship uh, history or colonial history, or some systems were highly influenced by uh, Soviet Union's fall. So we could make this comparison, how historical influences, uh, historical past affected academic profession and universities roles in this world. And second, we also focused and uh, made a comparison what's the government's role in coordinating you know, all this research and development uh, structure. Uh, for example, some governments, they had a very centralized role. On the other hand, some other governments had a very decentralized roles in uh, coordinating research and development and knowledge production policies. Uh, some systems were also influenced by international or regional associations influences compared to others. Some systems had more uh, division of roles in terms of federal government and st state government. On the other hand, uh, other systems, they didn't have such divisions. Authoritarian regimes, politically unstable regimes, or also different across the systems. If they had a dictatorship history, research development and academic profession development were also differently shaped in their uh, country and also economic situation whether they follow the planned economy historically or market economy, all these things highly affected academic professions engagement in knowledge uh, production. Yes, and then third, we also compare to what extent business sector and industri industries were engaged in research and development structure and I made a comparison between all these countries and jurisdictions, what kind of, how much uh, business were engaged in terms of partnership, collaborations, innovations. 
Uh, for example, some systems, uh, business sector, they only have uh, influence in allocating funding, supporting the funding. On the other hand, some systems, they had a strong partnership in coordinating research uh, production, or some other countries, they had uh, more influence in organizing the curriculum and uh, students' uh, teaching area for the industry uh, influence. And all these uh, comparison made the think of uh, like how universities position itself in the whole structure of the knowledge and development. So lastly, we focus on universities' roles, uh, how much like they take the leading roles or secondary roles in knowledge production. Uh, and al although uh, a lot of things were depend on the their historical development of a higher education sector, we could still find something new trend, for example, in East Asia, how much is strong government is, uh, engagement are now uh, prevalent, and then they make a strong investment in research and postgraduate education. So based on all these findings, we could uh, provide implications uh, for the academic profession study as a kind of foundational book for the whole international comparative project. And we identified similarities in changing academic profession and also postgraduate education. At the same time, we could identify different challenges that each system is going through and then provided the final implications to the academic profession study. So, uh, Mari? Yes, Jisun. Aha! Here we are. Well, as you can see, as you can see, uh, this uh, this volume uh, has a lot of stuff in it. I mean, there's a lot of it covers it covers a lot of stuff, and um, uh, I, I think what we what we want to do we want to be sure to leave you with with a with a sort of a a, a tangible uh, uh, takeaway. And I think uh, from our perspective, the, the tangible takeaway is an approach um, to comparative higher education. I mean, that's really what we're talking about. Um, and historically, um, comparative higher education has been um, sort of case studies of individual countries. That has been the, 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 the sort of the mode and there's actually been not so much co real comparison. Um, there's been juxtaposition of countries' stories and narratives uh, with each other or against each other. Um, um, that, uh, that began to change. And, and there's one um, uh, uh, volume that I think of as a sort of a classic in the field, which is um, Christine Mousselin's uh, study of uh, academic markets. Uh, that was done uh, probably about 10 years ago, um, or uh, the research for it was done more like 15 years ago. But what, what uh, Christine did was to, to look at the, um, the job market uh, and how it operated for academics in three very different national uh, settings in Germany, uh, the US, uh, and France. And uh, in order to do that, what she did was ask herself first, what are the basic elements? You know, what are the basic stru structural elements of an academic labor market uh, upon which we can draw comparisons between those three uh, national settings? And so she identified um, uh, variables, control, what I would call control variables like uh, who makes hiring decisions? Is hiring done by individual institutions? Is it done by disciplinary uh, associations? Is it done by government agencies? Um, is the market, uh, the job market, a relatively open one, or is it fairly closed with, with a series of restricted lanes? And uh, that allowed her uh, to put together a volume that genuinely looked at how academic uh, careers unfold in very different ways um, under very different uh, labor market conditions in different settings. And um, uh, allow us to begin to, to think through and think about how uh, some of these structural factors affect 
uh, academic work and academic uh, careers. Now, Glenn Jones and, and I, um, uh, maybe uh, five or 10 years ago, uh, tried to build a little bit on Christine's work and, and, and did a piece, uh, uh, an edited volume called uh, Professional, Professorial, Professorial Pathways. And, and in, in that volume, we, we looked at academic, we, we, we attempted to sort of um, build on uh, uh, Christine's method and try to identify uh, what are the sort of the building blocks of academic careers um, and, and, and could we uh, assemble a group of scholars to look um, uh, not just generally at individual national narratives, but look at how those building blocks uh, are, are structured and play out in different national settings. Um, and uh, and that resulted, in, and I think a very, very useful um, look at academic careers and allowing us to begin to ask questions about how um, uh, does job security, how does uh, things like tenure, how, how does that, how is that related uh, to career outcomes, both productivity and performance and other kinds of outcomes. Uh, and now, uh, and I think we need to move to the, to the last slide. Is it the last slide or the next slide? How do I do that? Ah, that's how I do that. <laughs> and, and what this slide includes is a number of, uh, of pieces that have come out more generally of the APEX uh, project uh, that I think uh, uh, have as their basic bedrock principle, uh, the idea that we are asking uh, uh, national uh, study teams to generate um, similar kinds of data uh, on their systems and uh, data that is structurally sufficiently significant that allows us to make comparisons between those structural elements across systems. Next. So for example, um, in the current volume that, that, that uh, we're celebrating today, uh, we asked every uh, country team in, in producing these case studies, um, we needed to include basic data on per capita income um, uh, for the country. So are we dealing with, with rich countries, developing countries? Uh, what about the per capita investment in research and development? Uh, including big uh, recent changes in that. Uh, are universities the uh, uh, primary driver of research and development in the country or really quite secondary to the research and development uh, system? Um, uh, are we talking about a binary higher education system um, or a uh, uh, identifiable uh, research university uh, system? Uh, what percent of the age grade uh, in, 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 the, in the country is enrolled in post-secondary education? Is it a mass system? Is it, is it, is it a universal system? Is it, is it a, uh, an elite system? Um, so these are some of the uh, uh, sort of key control variables. Once we begin to, to uh, uh, identify these metrics, it becomes possible to ask a series of questions uh, that one couldn't ask before. And those questions include um, uh, what, um, what, what, what seems to happen in, um, uh, in binary systems or systems that are characterized uh, uh, by a strong or an, a strong emphasis on a research university sector. Um, and how do those systems, are there patterns in how those systems respond uh, as opposed to systems that don't have a research university sector or uh, where uh, a research doesn't drive the higher education system? Um, so that's th those are the kinds of questions that, that these kinds of analyses allow us to ask. And it seems to me that the, the great 
you know, so overarching contribution of, of a volume of a project such as this and a volume such as this is that it pushes us, it pushes us to think about uh, these common metrics and sort of the structural analysis of higher education systems and allowing us, I think, to, uh, to study higher education systems in a truly comparative way. Uh, uh, so uh, I'm very excited about it, and I hope you are too, and I hope you will take this away, that we will all march forward uh, from, this, uh, from this webinar uh, to begin uh, thinking about our comparative work in this way. Good, my colleagues, is that is that okay? All right. Well, let's conclude simply by thanking. I wanna thank all of my colleagues for, for, um, um, for allowing me to be part with them um, uh, of this initiative. And wanna thank Ash, of course, for uh, uh, this award and uh, the opportunity provided by this webinar. And of course, we want to think about, this is such a collaborative project. I mean, the four of us are up here, but as, as Glenn and Timo made, made clear, this is, this is the, these are the results of work of, of maybe 80 people and 20, you know, 80 scholars in 20 countries. And um, um, the, this, this um, uh, edited volume that we put together is really uh, rests on the shoulders of all of us. It is, uh, and and uh, uh, just want to be sure we acknowledge that. Thank you again. Well, thank you. And on behalf of the council, um, I'd like to um, say this is a wonderful webinar. It gives us food for thought um, in terms of um, not only the process of comparative, but the thematic approach to the analysis. Um, we do have one question. Um, so for anybody who has a question, you can write it in the Q&A and um, either the authors will answer it directly or we can have a discussion based on it. So the first question that has been posted and that's not the only one, I encourage everybody to start to write your questions is from Sarah Bano who asked, Thanks for the wonderful presentation. How did you select countries for comparison? Also representation from Africa seems limited. What are your thoughts on this? I see, I see Timo has, maybe I'll, I'll add something and Timo can, can, uh, can jump in because Timo of course has this wonderful leadership uh, and challenging uh, leadership position within the arrangement. I mean, I think in the best possible circumstances, Apex Project would include every jurisdiction on earth, um, um, but it's a highly decentralized project. And so the, for it to work in the way in which it's been organized, we essentially require both uh, expertise uh, and willingness on the part of, of a nation to participate in this. Perhaps even more importantly, it requires that uh, jurisdiction and that research team to find the funding to participate in this. And those are challenging in some jurisdictions, both because of the lack of expertise. There are countries where there's relatively little scholarship in the field of higher education, um, but also because of the funding issue. And so we've had uh, we've had teams uh, even in in um, in sort of what you would consider major Western countries withdraw because of a lack of funding from those jurisdictions. They could not access the research funding they want. Um, so so I think the notion is that in a decentralized approach like this, it's not so much a matter of, of, of selecting countries as it is in terms of communicating with those who might be interested and their willingness to participate, but almost more importantly, their ability to access the resources to administer this in their own country, in their own language, and in their own jurisdiction. Atimo, did you want to add to, to that? Uh, thank you. Uh, it's uh, a, <clears throat> uh, uh, you, you, you uh, uh, raised uh, the most important arguments. I'd just like to add that uh, the international database includes 22 higher education systems that have participated in previous one, ones, uh, 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 and they also include higher education systems that have met conditions of the consortium. 
So it is therefore based on voluntariness and not on systematic selection. Uh, because like Glenn said, uh, it is uh, not centralized system. In the presentation, I also referred to the fact that the teams uh, should identify the reference countries with which the comparison is well grounded. And I think this volume in hand now provides uh, opportunities for that. There was uh, also a uh, question about uh, uh, African countries because only Uganda is involved. Uh, the South African team coordinates the uh, uh, African countries and they aim to carry out uh, a joint survey, but uh, unfortunately this hasn't taken place yet. But because this is a global survey, of course we uh, uh, we cooperate and, and, and give all our, our tools for this purpose and, and uh, we, we change views all the time and I'm, I'm pretty optimistic that this will take place. Another question is on the same theme um, about um, India and other South Asian countries not being included. But I'm gonna add this on um, um, the first question um, uh, writer says, thanks for the answer. Yes, it makes sense in terms of voluntary participation. So it seems like there was an open call. Yeah, the, the, in some respects, it's a matter of self-selection of countries based on practical matters. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was a question about India and South Asian countries uh, from the last project, from the previous project in 2008, there was a spin-off project this, after the main project. And then some of the Southeast Asian countries, they joined in a spin-off project. So it means uh, all the global survey uh, was finished at some point and then some regional scholars in Asia and Europe also, they had a kind of European spin-off project and Asian countries, they also had a spin-off project including some of Southeast, and Southeast Asian countries. So hopefully uh, after this APEX uh, survey collection, and then they might have a kind of a regional uh, follow-up studies. Uh, so it's still, there is a still chance, yeah. Well, thank you. Um, please uh, invite everybody to submit their questions. Um, I will ask a question while we're waiting for people to collect their thoughts. Um, I was interested in your themes. Did you develop the themes before you analyzed the data? Um, I, I got the sense that that might be true. And Either way, was it before or after? And can you comment on um, that form of development? I, I see, I hear silence on the part of my colleagues. I mean, I, I think it depends a little bit on whether you're talking about the broader project of APEX or the book itself. So for the broader project of APEX, I, I would argue that the themes that uh, influence sort of new questions and new territories emerged collaboratively uh, within the conversations of the leadership of the teams. Uh, so that I think that that uh, Timo and Monica and others essentially brought people together and there was a conversation about what, what are the new themes and how, how should they emerge. In the concept of if, if the question is about the case studies that are in the book, I mean, I, I think what 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 how this works is essentially there were common themes that emerged part of the Apex project, and the editorial team essentially said we need to have some common elements here. We want to have a national story, but we do need to have some common elements, including the common use of of certain data sets from OECD and others. Uh, so so the the case studies are driven by a kind of common agenda that I think emerged from a broader conversation. And so um, you're right. In other words, there was a, a pre-calculation of issues that we thought should be addressed in the various national chapters, but also I think the flexibility for individuals to tell the national story in the way that those who are experts in that particular country um, thought was best. So it's a combination of things. And then of course, by the time we received these chapters, the challenge was how to identify what may be common themes, some of which we anticipated, some of which we did not. Uh, and those largely emerged, I think, from a kind of cross-case analysis of the 18 national case studies. Yeah. 
I, I think Glenn has summarized it well. Yeah, I, I think too. And the value of this book uh, is also there that um, that uh, uh, if we only have a data in hand, so we lose the context. But uh, with the book in hand, we also have a context for these uh, countries, and we understand uh, better that uh, wh why there are so many differences between countries and 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 the trends between them. Uh, Monica Marguina is also here uh, in the seminar, so so of course uh, you are welcome to to uh, give your view. But I think that we have a, a, a quite a, uh, quite many types of higher education systems presented here, and that's also a value of of the book. It was very interesting to work with the chapter from that point of view. In in terms of process, uh, there was a moment. Uh, after all of the country chapters were completed, uh, where the co-editors uh, actually sat down on Zoom and asked themselves, okay, um, what does this all mean? And, and what, are the, what are the major themes here? Uh, and, uh, and, and we did some drafts, some back and forth am among the four of us uh identifying themes and stuff so so in in that in that portion of the project it was it was quite inductive i think um but again obviously informed by the by the variables that we started with the, the basic structural variables we started with which were largely OC, oecd data well thank you um um, that I found that to be interesting. Um, Alana Pop is saying thank you for the presentation and hi to Dr. Finkelstein. And um, Monica Marquina says hello. Um, just providing context. Um, and again, if you have questions, uh, we do have um, a few minutes left to the session. Um, please um, put them into the um, Q and A. Um, you mentioned at the beginning change over time. So, um, was this part of the design that you wanted to capture, or did you realize that some of the data bringing in was referencing the time aspect? Um, and then I would ask as a follow-up to that, um, what were the most significant changes over time that you found? And anybody can answer it. Well, in, in, in when, the, when the individuals who were involved in the uh, CAP project in 2007-08, uh, which was sort of the intermediate project we displayed on that on that uh, uh, timeline, uh, the, the CAP project deliberately sought to ask some of the same questions that Carnegie and Altbach had asked in 1992, mm -hmm. in 2007, 15 years later. And then uh, in putting together the APEX survey, and, and, and Timo, correct me if, if I'm wrong, uh, there was a, a, a general desire where, where appropriate and relevant to take some of those same questions, preferably asked in the same language, uh, uh, once again uh, in 2017, uh, to allow us to, to have these sort of 15 year uh, uh, time series. So we, we did self-consciously, at least in part, uh, try to do that, although we were, uh, obviously, the samples were very different, so this was no, in no way, sort of a panel uh, survey. In, in answer to your second question about the greatest findings, I think the answer is we're still learning from it. Um, I think it's important to recognize that this is actually the, the beginning and the sort of foundational book for the academic profession, the Knowledge Society Project. So, so the design is really how do um, one, one could argue that the design of the book is really about about understanding national contexts. Um, and, and, and we actually don't use much of the data from the APEX project in the volume at all. 
but following this volume, we're now seeing the release of uh, papers and academic journal articles, but most importantly, a series of other books emerging in the same book series that are thematic. So the first that emerged was on teaching and research in the academy, um, and essentially does comparative work amongst the, those who participate in the international database uh, to look at these issues, um, uh, these in, in key themes of teaching and research and the balance between teaching and research. Uh, within the, the these these various jurisdictions, so the most recent book, which is about to come out, is on internationalization in the academic profession. So we have these thematic volumes again with multiple authors, multiple collaborative initiatives um, that are exploring key themes associated with the research study along the way. So this book is the first of the project, and we'll see a whole series of volumes come out over the next few years, which attempt to answer your question: What are some of the key issues and themes in comparative terms? emerging from this analysis of a common questionnaire amongst more than 20 countries. And it's it's just a huge body of research that we're just beginning, I think, to work our way through. Well, one of the really, really interesting uh, uh, facts here is that is the timing of the survey was pre-COVID. And mm -hmm. uh, as we're all aware, higher education has changed in profound ways in response uh, to the pandemic, and and in fact, Timo can address this because I I think, I think uh, there is some movement uh, either Timo or Monica uh, to to do a sort of a a post COVID sort of quick quick mm -hmm. update uh, 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 on this, uh, uh, and 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 one other thing, just a, just a quick a quick shout out since you mentioned Glenn the internationalization volume. Uh, a quick shout out to our Turkish colleagues who have who have undergone uh, a sort of a devastating experience. Uh, one of my Turkish colleagues uh, explained it to me by saying, uh, "This is just like 9/11 for Americans." Uh, so, so, so please, uh, 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 we're all thinking about our Turkish colleagues Absolutely. and Syrian colleagues, of course. Well. This was wonderful, um, a wonderful way to chat um, for um, learning about the project, learning about what's coming up <laughs> in the future in terms of ch um, change over time and comparative um, uh, discourse. And I wanna thank each one of you, um, Dr. Oh, Dr. Zarava, um, Finkelstein, Jung, and... Um, yeah, I'm looking at my screen, Jones. <laughs> um, I encourage everybody to um, get the book and read it because um, I found it fascinating and I know everybody will too. So thank you and look forward to hearing announcements from the council for upcoming activities and um, uh, opportunities. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.